Thanks. I want to talk to you today about Arbitrum, a system that through a combination of unique features provides the scalability, efficiency, and privacy that you want from smart contracts uh, in a natural programming model. Now, of course, when we're talking about smart contracts, there's sort of the prototypical smart contract involves two parties, Alice and Bob, who agree that they want to have the terms of their interaction be governed by some sort of rule set. They take that rule set and embody it in a piece of code, and they inject that code into a virtual machine that runs inside the cryptocurrency system. And I'll use the term virtual machine or VM to talk about a contract here, because just to bear in mind that that's what it really is. Uh, now, the VM will operate according to its code. That's enforced by the cryptocurrency system itself, of course. And, of course, the, the uh, smart contract or VM should be a first-class citizen within the system, meaning that it can hold money, it can send and receive messages and money just like a person could. Now, the most common system, of course, that implements smart contracts is Ethereum. Uh, and Ethereum has some virtues, but one of the challenges that it has is with scalability. In Ethereum, every miner needs to emulate every step of execution of every VM. Uh, and that's very expensive. Uh, as a result, Ethereum charges gas to those who would want to advance the state of VMs. Uh, and uh, in order to compensate the miners for the relatively high cost of, of, um, of em all of that emulation. Uh, gas is necessary because of that high, high price. And the complexity of contracts, both in terms of computation and storage uh, is capped by a global gas limit. The global gas limit is necessary to make sure that we don't overtax the capacity of individual miners to do all of that emulation. Also in Ethereum, all contract code and data is public. So the total throughput in Ethereum is limited to the number of steps that a single miner can emulate in one block plus a healthy margin of error to make sure that the miners have room for other work, such as, for example, mining. So one of the key questions is, can we scale smart contracts? And of course, I'm going to argue today that the answer is yes. Uh, now, just to be clear about what we're talking about scaling, uh, if we talk in the standard three-layer model where we have layer one that does consensus and layer two that implements smart contracts, and on the top layer three that implements some kind of application functionality, we're talking here about scaling uh, layer two, the smart contract layer. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about an approach that is compatible with pretty much any layer one approach you want to use. And so layer one scalability is a separate problem. We can work with anyone who has a good solution to it. And I'll talk later on about what we do in our first commercial implementation. So there are a bunch of alternative approaches to getting scalability. There's a huge uh, set of these, and I can't possibly hope to summarize them all in, an, uh, in a few minutes here. But let me just talk about some of the issues that some alternative approaches tend to have. So for example, approaches that are based on SNARKs or other kind of fancy zero-knowledge proof technologies uh, tend to have two types of problems. Uh, one type has to do with requiring a trusted setup for every contract. And that can be both expensive and also unrealistic from a trust point of view, because there may not be a party who is trusted to do that uh, trusted setup. Similarly, uh, SNARK or zero-knowledge proof-based systems, although they often do reduce the amount of work that needs to be done on-chain, uh, often they blow up the, uh, the workload off-chain, because off-chain proofs can be extremely expensive, often prohibitively expensive, to generate. The second type of approach I want to talk about, by contrast, is incentivized verification, as in systems like Truebit. And here the idea is that you are trying to induce, through incentives, parties to voluntarily check up on each other's computations, to check each other's computations for correctness. Uh, and one drawback of these systems is that your contracts, state, and code are necessarily public, so you don't get the privacy you might want. But also there are some serious incentive compatibility problems with this. And our academic paper from Usenix Security back in August um, uh, explains uh, at least one serious incentive compatibility problem that applies to Truebit as well as many systems in this general category. Uh, and then third, you have some types of approaches based on state channels. And the simplest version of state channels assumes that you're going to get unanimous off-chain agreement on what a contract or VM will do. 
Um, and of course, the challenge here is how to deal with dispute resolution. So there are many approaches out there. We think all of them have problems compared to Arbitrum, and we'd be happy to discuss offline uh, how we contrast with things that I haven't mentioned here. Okay, so Arbitrum uh, makes smart contracts scalable and private in a practical way, and it does this by a combination of three different types of methods. First, we rely on protocol design. We have a protocol that moves almost all of the work off-chain uh, and just a little bit of verification work on-chain, but without requiring exotic cryptography to be done uh, on or off-chain. Uh, we also rely on incentives to push parties toward the lowest cost and most scalable approach to moving the state of a VM forward. Uh, and then finally, we rely on an innovative virtual machine architecture, which, makes, which helps along with protocol design to make the cost of dispute resolution extremely low, much, much lower than in any other system that we know of. Okay, so let me dig uh, a bit more deeply into how Arbitrum works. Uh, and first, I wanna remind you that we are not talking here about layer one, the consensus layer. There are lots of different ways to do the consensus layer. You can do proof of work or proof of stake type mining. You can have a central authority or some kind of quorum or BFT type system. Lots of ways to do that. The Arbitrum approach, approach is inherently agnostic as to this choice. So I will just use the generic term verifier to refer to whatever layer one technology you have. And so we're just going to assume there is a verifier that verifies the validity of transactions and publishes a log of accepted tra transactions. And we're going to build on top of that. That's going to be a pluggable module in at least the abstract design. Okay. Now one of the key ideas in the design of Arbitrum is the notion of managers. So when you make a VM to implement a contract in Arbitrum, you give a list of parties who will act as managers for that VM. The job of the managers is to keep track of the state of the VM, to follow along as it executes, and to make sure that the VM is executing according to its code. Uh, and Arbitrum provides a very strong guarantee with respect to trust in the managers, what we call the AnyTrust guarantee. And that is that as long as at least one manager of a VM is honest, then the VM will execute correctly according to its code. Even if N minus one of the managers are colluding to try to get a wrong answer, the one honest manager can heroically force the VM to execute correctly. And so what that means is that you can trust that a VM will execute correctly as long as you trust at least one manager. So here's a simple example of a simple contract. Imagine a two-player game. Alice and Bob are going to play chess for a coin. Uh, they agree on the code of a VM, which receives alternating moves from them, makes sure the moves are legal. Um, and determines when the game is over and then pays out the coin to whoever won the game. Now in this scenario, one easy way to assign managers is to just make Alice and Bob the two managers for this VM. Alice now trusts at least one manager because she trusts herself and similarly for Bob. Each of Alice and Bob know that there's one manager who will stand up for their rights to get the coin if they in fact have won the game. Uh, and so Alice and Bob are now happy and the rest of us don't really care if Alice and Bob want to split up the coin some other way, that's fine with us. Alternatively, Alice might choose to outsource this. She might outsource the job of being a manager to her trusted friend. She might decide to hire three manager for higher services uh, on the assumption that at least one of them will behave honestly. You can design whatever set of managers you want as long as everyone who has a stake or interest in the contract trusts at least one of them. Okay, now, how do the managers cooperate off-chain in order to advance the state of a VM? Arbitrum creates incentives that push the managers toward agreeing unanimously about what a VM will do. And if all of the managers do agree off-chain on what a VM will do, then the system will accept the assertion. And that's okay according to the AnyTrust requirement because if all of the managers have agreed that something will happen, then under the assumption that at least one manager is honest, well, the honest manager was part of that agreement, and therefore the system can believe that the agreement is correct and, and, it, and is consistent with the AnyTrust guarantee. So here's how this is implemented. The way this is implemented is that the managers can get together and they create what we call a unanimous assertion, which is depicted here. So over on the left, you have a set of preconditions, in particular two preconditions, 
um, for the assertion. And that says that what this assertion says is that if the cryptographic hash of the state of the VM has a particular value in the beginning, and the hash of the VM's inbox, where it receives messages from the world, has a particular hash, then the VM will be able to execute n steps of computation, that the resulting state will have a particular hash and a particular inbox hash, and that the VM along the way will take a particular set of actions. That is, it will send a particular set of coins to particular parties, and it will emit certain messages. So this is a unanimous assertion. Uh, if this assertion is signed by all of the managers, and if the precondition is true, and if the VM has enough funds on hand to make the payments in the assertion, then, uh, then the verifier, the miners, will accept that this assertion is correct, it will be confirmed, and the state of the VM will be advanced on-chain. The miners or verifier will then record on-chain the new hash of the VM and its, uh, and its inbox, and will cause the actions to occur. But what if all of the managers don't agree? If all of the managers don't agree, we fall back on a mechanism called disputable assertions. Uh, and the way this works is that any manager acting by itself can make an assertion, a claim, about what a VM will do. And when a disputable assertion is made, the manager who makes it puts down a deposit. Uh, and that deposit is security against the possibility that that manager is actually lying. So once that assertion is made, there's a period of time in which any other manager can show up and lay down a challenge, say, no, that assertion is not correct. The challenger then also deposits funds, and now we have a dispute, and there's a dispute resolution protocol that I'll describe in a minute. Um, if there is a challenge and a dispute, the party who is wrong is going to lose their deposit. The party who's right will take part of that deposit, and the other part will be burned. So these deposits and the penalty for being caught out as wrong creates an incentive against issuing a false challenge and also an incentive against making a false assertion. So here's how this works. Um, in one scenario, uh, a manager makes a disputable assertion saying that starting with some precondition, n steps of computation are possible, leading to some post-condition hash of the machine state with some set of actions. Um, what, this is recorded on chain and a timer is started. Um, if the timer expires without any challenge, then the verifier or miners will confirm this transaction as, uh, as accepted. And it's deemed to have happened. The logic being that there was a period of time where if this was wrong, anybody, any manager could show up and take a big pile of money by claiming that it was wrong. And the fact that no manager did that is evidence that uh, this assertion was actually correct. Alternatively, if a manager makes a disputable assertion and before the timer runs out, another manager shows out and issues a challenge, now these two managers, that the asserter and the challenger, have put down deposits and we enter the dispute resolution protocol. Uh, and this works in two stages. First, there's a bisection process. Now the asserter who made the initial claim has to bisect their assertion into two pieces that are half as big. They say, what is that, the hash of the state at the midpoint at, after n over two, two instructions? They have to break that, uh, they have to say what the hash is halfway through, and they have to break the set of actions taken in their initial claim into two pieces. So that these two, we now have two sub-assertions which compose to yield the entire assertion. And the verifier just needs to make sure that these two sub-assertions do in fact compose to yield the initial assertion. Now, if the initial assertion was wrong, then it follows that at least one of these two halves has to be wrong. And so the onus is now on the challenger to identify one of the two halves that's wrong. And so the challenger, let's say, chooses to challenge the second half. Now what we've done, of course, in this uh, bisection step is we've cut the size of the dispute in half from n instructions to n over two instructions. And we just continue to do that recursively, uh, and we keep going. Um, eventually, we get a uh, an assertion about a single step of execution, which is challenged. And now at this point, we shift to the one-step proof phase of dispute resolution, where the asserter has to prove that, in fact, their one-step claim is correct. In other words, they have to prove that starting with the state hash on the left, that executing one step of, of execution, one instruction in the virtual machine, will lead to the state hash on the right. 
And so, of course, at this point, the key question is how big is that one-step proof and how costly is it to create and verify? And this is where we get to the innovative aspects of the Arbitrum VM architecture, that is, the machine architecture on which this VM code uh, executes. The Arbitrum VM architecture is designed so that all instructions can be emulated in small constant time. And constant means independent of how much code there is in your VM and independent of how much data it has. Also, the VM architecture guarantees that one-step proofs are of small constant size, by which I mean a few hundred bytes in practice, and they can be created and verified in small constant time, by which I mean a few milliseconds. So this is not only constant and independent of the size and complexity of your VM, but it's also very, very small and fast. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, we do that by following these four principles in the design of the VM. First of all, the entire state of the VM is organized in a tree so that you can compute a, uh, a hash tree, Merkle tree style, over the entire state to get a root hash, which is a digest of the entire state of the VM. Second, that the tree is of limited degree, so the branching factor at any point is no more than eight. That means that you can update the state of any node from the state of its children in constant bounded time. Third, we guarantee that every leaf is of limited size, no more than 32 bytes, so that you can recompute the hash of a leaf in constant bounded time. And then finally, uh, and this is the really tricky part, is that we guarantee that instructions only ever touch uh, items that are high in this tree, uh, in the top three levels of the tree. Because all of these things are true, it's always possible to make a one-step proof by unwrapping up to only, uh, by unwrapping only a little bit of the tree up near the top to reveal what is the underlying data and, and stub hashes for part of the Merkle tree. And that will be enough for the verifier to uh, execute one step of, of computation and update, compute the new updated state hash. So to understand why this is hard, let me talk about why these things are not constant in, in size or time to verify in a conventional architecture. So here on the left, I show how memory might be implemented in a conventional VM architecture. Memory would be implemented as a flat uh, array shown at the bottom, and we're going to summarize it with a Merkle tree, which is constructed on top of that by a VM emulator um, of logarithmic height. And so in order to, if we have the a root hash of that Merkle tree, and we want to demonstrate that the cell at the bottom with the five in it really should be a five, then we need to exhibit everything that is, uh, that is shaded in this tree, and actually also the round node in the bottom right. Uh, apologies for leaving that out. Uh, this is a logarithmic amount of stuff, uh, and therefore it, um, anything that reads or writes that five is going to require a logarithmic amount of work, uh, and unwrapping, the, um, exhibiting the Merkle proof that that leaf is a five will take logarithmic time to create and check. Similarly, over on the right, uh, where we're talking about code, now we have similarly a flat array of, of instructions in a traditional, in a conventional architecture, and a program counter that's an index into it. And to prove that the instruction under the current program counter is, let's say, a read instruction, also is going to require logarithmic time to do and uh, logarithmic space to represent um, for the same reason as on the left. So how do we get around these, uh, these logarithmic factors and achieve small constant time and space for both of these functions? We do that by changing the VM architecture. Let me talk first about how we handle memory. The way that memory is uh, organized in the Arbitrum VM architecture is that instead of having a large flat memory, we organize memory as a set of fixed size blocks that we call tuples. And a tuple can contain other tuples by reference in a, distribu in a distributed acyclic fashion. Uh, the result is that the units of memory are all of constant size. And if you want to implement something like a large flat memory or some other data structure, that has to be implemented in software within the Arbitrum virtual machine. So rather than a virtual machine emulator managing a tree to implement the abstraction of a large flat memory, instead, um, application level code needs to manage that tree. And it can do the same kind of Merkle tree structure that is done in the, um, uh, by the emulator in the conventional architecture. Now, of course, 
uh, uh, application programmers don't want to do that, so you want to encapsulate that inside a library, and we provide a library that does that. So instead of executing a memory read instruction in a conventional architecture, you instead call a library to make a read to the large flat memory abstraction in the Arbitrum world. So you might think, well, that not that more expensive? But it turns out it's not, and here's why. The reason is in a conventional architecture, you can do a read in one instruction, but that instruction takes logarithmic time to implement and prove. On the other hand, in Arbitrum, it takes a logarithmic amount of time uh, instructions because you have to walk or modify uh, a, a sort of Merkle tree. On the other hand, each of those instructions takes constant time to emulate, prove, and verify. So the cost of verification and emulation is actually the same in total um, over the execution of your code. But in a conventional architecture, to make, do a one-step proof, it takes logarithmic time and space to do a proof and verification. Whereas in Arbitrum, we get it down to small constant um, uh, size and uh, proof and verification time. So that's the improvement. Proving gets faster. And proving is the thing that matters for scaling, because proving has to be done on chain. What about instructions? We also change the way that, that instructions and code execution are implemented. Instead of storing the code in a list or sequence or a flat array, as in a conventional architecture, Code is stored in Arbitrum in a sort of stack data structure. Instead of advancing the program counter to move to the next instruction, we instead pop the instruction stack to get the next instruction that the machine is supposed to execute. That still gives you a sequence of instructions, but you can do it in small constant time. Uh, where conventional architecture would jump, you can instead replace the instruction stack with a reference to a new stack that represents the new place that you're going to. Instead of when you would want to call a function in a conventional architecture, you would instead push a reference to the current instruction stack onto a sort of call stack. Uh, and because all these things happen by manipulating uh, immutable references in the Arbitrum VM architecture, all of this happens also in constant time and uh, to emulate. So what, is, what does, um, so what does a, a, a one-step proof actually look like? Let me give you an example. Uh, this shows the top part of the Merkle tree that represents the Arbitrum VM state. Um, there's a state root, and the state root is what gets encoded on chain. Suppose I wanted to prove that for a certain hash of the state root, that, uh, that executing um, one instruction would lead to some other hash. And suppose that it happens to be the case that the instruction that, that is executing here is an add instruction. Well, this shows how much of the Merkle tree needs to be exhibited in order, to, uh, uh, in order to allow a verifier to verify this proof. Um, the, uh, we need to exhibit the hashes of the five boxes at the bottom here, and the verifier needs to make sure that they hash together to yield the root hash. We then need to open up the instruction stack to show that the top of it is in fact an add instruction, followed by something whose hash we reveal but isn't, um, is, isn't needed in order to do verification. Similarly, we would then reveal the top two layers of the data stack to show that the things at the top are, let's say, a five and a three, followed by something whose hash is revealed but which isn't relevant to this proof. The other three parts of the, of the Arbitrum virtual machine, the call stack, static value, and registers, uh, don't need to be unpacked because they are not affected by the add instruction. So given this unpacking, a verifier can verify that there is an add instruction, figure out that 5 plus 3 equals 8, um, and can figure out enough information to compute the new state hash and compute that. So very little needs to be revealed uh, as part of the one-step proof, and this would take uh, just a couple hundred bytes at maximum. Okay, so that's how we, Arbitrum gets extremely efficient and scalable execution of smart contracts. How do we get privacy? Uh, well, the fundamental uh, fact about privacy in Arbitrum is that the state of a VM is revealed only to the VM's managers. The managers need to know the state of your VM, but nobody else needs to know. The, all that appears on chain is saltable hashes of the VM state, and because they're saltable, uh, they don't need to reveal anything about what's really going on inside the VM. The number and timing of the steps that are executed might be revealed if you're doing disputable assertions. Um, and of course, all of the publicly visible actions of the VM, such as messages it sends or currency that it sends or receives, has to be recorded on chain because everybody needs to be able to see those things. 
But that's all. If you trust your managers to maintain the privacy of your VM, then your VM, then the state of your VM beyond these things at the bottom of the slide will not be revealed to anybody. Okay, so we've built an academic prototype of this. It is described in our paper in Usenix Security back in, um, back in August. Um, it consists of a VM emulator, an assembler, and loader that lets you write uh, assembly code uh, um, in, a, in, a natural, uh, in a natural programming model and compile it to run directly on the Arbitrum virtual machine. Um, there's an honest manager component which makes and defends assertions and does the job of an honest manager. Uh, the implementation supports pluggable consensus algorithms, and we also implemented an Arbitrum standard library which provides a bunch of facilities that application programmers will want, such as the abstraction of a large flat memory and a bunch of other useful data structures. That's the academic prototype. The first commercial version of this, which is under development now, uh, is built to operate on top of Ethereum. It interoperates with Ethereum. That means that you will be able to compile VM code from Solidity. You'll be able to take Solidity code, cross-compile it to run directly on the Arbitrum virtual machine. Uh, VMs running on this version of Arbitrum can handle, can own, and transfer Ether or any other ERC-20 or ERC-721 token that exists in Ethereum land. Uh, and, so you, and so it should be relatively straightforward to take a contract that's designed to run on Ethereum and move it onto Arbitrum, get interoperation and much better performance and lower cost, as well as better privacy. Uh, there's an Arbitrum token, which we call ARBs, and those are used for the deposits that managers need to put down in order to participate in the protocol. But everything else you do can use whatever token you want. Uh, and this, uh, this commercial version is in development by Offchain Labs, our startup now. So to give you an idea of how much scalability you can get, uh, we implemented a, on our ap academic prototype a contract to do iterated hashing. It does iterated computation of SHA-2 hashes, um, and within a single VM uh, running on an ordinary laptop, we achieve almost a million SHA-2 hashes per second within a VM. Um, and by contrast, um, on a, uh, native code on the same machine does about 1.7 million SHA-2s per second. So an Ethereum, so an Arbitrum VM uh, for this application gets more than half the performance of native code uh, running on the same platform. By contrast, Ethereum supports something like 10,000 hashes per second globally on a system like this. Um, but the advantage of um, Arbitrum is even larger than that because this Ethereum limit is global, whereas the 970,000 on Arbitrum is per VM and this implementation can do thousands of VMs at the same time. So for this particular admittedly quirky contract, uh, Arbitrum can achieve something like a million X improvement in scalability over Ethereum. So there is a lot of upside here. Okay, so to wrap up, Arbitrum gives you, we believe, a combination of the best features of off-chain and on-chain solutions. Um, we give you high scalability and therefore low cost to execute your contracts. We give you privacy of your smart contract. You don't need to reveal the code or the state of the smart contract except to the managers you've chosen. And we give you a very natural model for writing the code and porting code from, exist from the existing Ethereum platform. We do this with a unique combination of protocol design, incentive mechanisms, and virtual machine architecture. Thanks. I'd be happy to talk to anybody offline um, afterward, and my co-founder, Stephen Goldfeder, is here as well, and yes, we're hiring. Thank you.